Hi, everyone. I'm Rick Bensignor. Today is Tuesday, January 26th, and welcome to this week's In the No Trader show. We've got a great lineup of things to talk about this week. We're going to start off in our education portion. We're going to entitle it Playing the Let's Squeeze the Institutional Shorts Game, which, of course, if you've been watching the news the last uh, 24 hours or so, you know what happened to GameStop yesterday, and we'll, we'll spend some time talking about what's going on uh, in that area and, and why some of these stocks that have huge short positions um, are flying. In our market overview, we'll take a look at the Russell 2000 this week by the IWM ETF. We'll take a look at the US 10-year and see what rates are doing. And then let's talk about platinum because uh, I've got some ideas on that too and um, kind of show you what's going on there. And then when we take a look at what to look at this week, uh, you know, or when we go through individual stocks, um, I figured I'm, I'm going to take the Barron's roundtable picks that uh, it was the cover story this week in Barron's. And uh, every year they have a panel of their supposed experts who they go to to give their picks for the year. So um, some of the top names that uh, these people picked uh, were these uh, 10 names here. So we will go through these and um, we'll see what the charts say, whether or not they look like they're good buys or not. To sign up to get my weekly ETF report that comes out generally Wednesday nights. Um, that's our TTR, our tactical trader report. Or if you're interested in uh, less short-term trading, but beating the S&P each year, that's our 7-Eleven monthly report. And as I've said to you, um, through the first five months of the year that we started this uh, last August 1st through the end of December 31st, we've outperformed the S&P by 2.1%. And uh, for those of you who understand the game of trying to outperform the S&P, that is significant. And that's only five months into a 12 month calendar year. So um, that is something that you can also sign up for on in the notrader.com. And of course, to uh, access me and get in touch with me, it's Rick at in the notrader.com. All right, so let's, uh, let's kind of talk about this this, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, but I'll, I'll, I'll use the word game. I used it here in the title and I, I think it's kind of the right way of looking at things. So as you know, in the last couple of days, um, some stocks and we'll, we'll focus on, for instance, GameStop, just because that's the one that went berserk yesterday, uh, is in the midst of what we call a short squeeze. And this is a short squeeze, not per se of individual investors. This is a short squeeze of institutions that have shorted the stock and have significant large uh, short positions. So in other words, these are people who have bet against the company uh, thinking that it's either going to zero or a very low price. And in fact, uh, it got down to about $2.60 last March when everything else fell apart. And this is, you know, GameStop is a, uh, a basically a retail store. They have online uh, ability to purchase online too. But I know like when I had young kids, especially young, uh, my young son, we were frequently going to GameStop when, um, you know, he was eight years old and 10 years old and stuff to buy video games and um this was a retail store that you could purchase them and you know xbox and xbox accessories and and all the games to play um and um what was the there's there's one from sony you know all these all these gaming devices and the games that one could play but over time they started having trouble because less and less people were going to their stores and uh you know, things were downloadable, were easy to access to other places. You didn't necessarily need to go to a store. And then that's why, you know, the stock was under pressure for the bulk of the last five years. Let me, um, let's go to that chart. And let me see, here's GameStop. So you can see the bulk of, you know, starting here, let's say in two, well, it, it, it came down from, I think, much higher levels. But here, even 
Let's start in 2013, down move, and that kind of kept going until recent. So um, as I said, this got down to very low, just uh, up, I guess it was down here. It must have been here, was last uh, March, where it got down to $2.57. So, you know, a lot of people bottom fish on this, and, you know, it's just kind of drifted lower and lower and lower. And you had these institutions that were had bet from on any bounces in the market that this was essentially going to zero or darn close. The analysts on Wall Street, their um, average target, I believe, is about um, $12 a share. Um, and so what, of course, happened, in, as we, you saw, starting last fall, this picked up strength, and even broke out. So here, let's do a little analysis before we get to um, kind of what's going on in the game. All right, so we took out the high, um, you opened above it that week, closed beneath, but eventually, you, you took out the high and then you you have here, let's get this to include every bit of the craziness that has happened in the last. So here's a week, this, this is a, a weekly chart. So, you know, here we are now at, uh, what is that, $88 or so with a high yesterday just beneath 160. Um, so what makes a stock go from, you know, a, a low teens stock to trade, I don't know, was that 14 times price in a matter of a couple of weeks? There's nothing particular about GameStop as far as the company. Um, the analysts still say this is basically a $12 stock, and that would be somewhat fair value. Um, but what's happened is there is this institutional short squeeze. Um, some of these chat rooms that exist. Um, yesterday, the culprit they claim came from a, a Reddit chat room. Um, there are other type of online, there's stock twits, there's, you know, uh, all different, Yahoo Finance, I believe, has chat rooms. There's all different places that uh, individual investors tend to come to, to trade ideas with each other and, and push ideas that they're, you know, people often talk, talk their book, so they're pushing their own ideas too. And Chatter started going around of just how short the institutional base was here. And that if this started breaking out, um, the institutions would get squeezed. And you're seeing over the last three weeks, the degree to which this has happened. And of course, institutions could have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of shares on the short side. And of course, at some point, they would have to cover those shorts um, or the company goes to zero, in which case their shorts gained the most amount possible. Um, but what happens in a short squeeze is that uh, price starts moving up and these institutions that have uh, big short positions, there's not enough people selling the stock you know, individual retail traders, you might see, you might be trading hundreds or even a couple thousand shares, but when these guys need to buy a hundred thousand or a quarter million shares at a clip, the only way they can do that is by going through the sell side firms that um, will make markets for them and play the other side. So here, both the companies and the sell side of Wall Street gets hurt. Is if your sell side market maker or dealer in this name and a client calls you up and says, you know, make me a, a bid offer on, on a quarter million shares. Um, let's assume that that buy side firm needed to cover a short. They buy it from the dealer on the street. The dealer is now short, let's say a quarter million shares. And all they can do is try to get rid of it. And, and it starts bidding up the stock across the street. And this goes on and on in, in to see a chart like you're looking at now. If you wanna play this game, I'm not saying you can't or you shouldn't, but you need to have some strategy if you're going to try to play this game of bottom fishing names that could break out to the upside. Um, now, I was just watching CNBC um, as I started recording this and I noticed that they were talking about GameStop and they mentioned some of the largest shorted companies out there. 
Um, so there is access to getting, which companies have very large short positions. Um, and those are the ones that are most vulnerable for uh, some of these spike moves. Should GameStop be trading at $87 or yesterday's $155 because of fundamentals? Absolutely not. This is a pure play on squeezing institutions. And in this case, this is one of the few times where the public uh, and those people who got involved in this were able to take advantage of institutions in a big way because it doesn't take a lot of institutions with short positions um, to all need to kind of cover at the same time and have what was at some point a very nice winning trade turn very quickly into a losing trade. So if you're gonna play this game, you've gotta have some strategy about how you get in, what you're willing to risk if the stock doesn't keep going up, because again, often these are priced above where any fundamentals would say they should be priced. And most importantly, how do you get out? Or where do you get out? What's the strategy? It's great, you know, if you, let's say you bought this pullback down here uh, to, I don't know, 17 or whatever these old highs were, where this purple line was. So it broke out, you bought this pullback, and then you're happy as well, heck, that next week, clearly a squeeze is going on. You, you've gone back now a few years and closed higher than any Friday close in the last few years. And then it continued into last week and then a massive range this week. I don't know if you guys can see it, but the high this week you can see is uh, 159.18. And we're currently trading in real time just beneath 88. Um, so you have this massive squeeze and you're happy as all heck. Your, your stock is double, tripled, what, you know, in a, in a very short amount of time, you, you, you're, you're laughing at how much money you make and you're calling yourself a genius. And for the moment you are a genius. The thing is price is already 50% of where it was yesterday. Um, and you're still making money, but where, how do you decide to get out? And I think you've got to have some type of plan uh, so that you're not stuck because it's possible that tomorrow the stock's trading 40. I'm not saying it will be, I have no clue. So Rick's not saying that, uh, I'm not making any recommendations here. I'm talking about from an educational point of view, how you, if you're gonna play this game, how you kind of play it. So you need some type of exit strategy. So that's a weekly chart. Here's a daily chart and you can see just you know what's gone on recently. So I'm guessing if you, I put up a moving average, that's not gonna help. The 200 day, look at this, the 200 day moving average is under where we're trading and it has been for a long time. So let's see, the last time price was above the 200 day was August. Um, so if you were fortunate enough to play this type of game, whether it was you know, in this stock or another, but we'll use this for the example. Um, you've got to look at, and maybe I'll switch back to a weekly chart here. You have to look at prior highs or something to take a guess at where this could stop. So if I took this 2013 high and I got into a stock at, you know, high teens, 20-ish, low 20s, doesn't matter. I could, and, and you see what goes on here, let's say last week, is it crazy to have taken half off as we got here? Probably not, because you've got to have some sense of where to get out. And sure, you would have missed yesterday's move, but would you have caught yesterday? Would, would you have known what happens if you weren't even looking at the market yesterday? You know, I'm, I'm not saying you would have or wouldn't have, but you've got to have some sense of where to potentially get out of this and let other people play the balance. So one thing is, let's say, looking at an old major high and something like that, there's a high up in here. So you, you, you could have taken some here, some here, regardless, I'm just saying half a strategy. What's one of the things I will look at? Well, clearly, um, if I've got a daily chart like that's been doing this, I'm gonna put up one of the, sequential type models to see where potential exhaustion is. Uh, and I realize there's a squeeze here, so these things don't always you know, capture it, but I wanna get a sense. And I'd probably use combo, which is a sister model to sequential, just because usually combo signals come up later than sequential ones do. In other words, sequential ones will come first. 
So if I put it up combo, it showed me that last week there was a 13. So even if you had gotten in at 20 and you sold some at 40, uh, not you, you doubled your money. This is a daily chart. Look at a weekly chart. It shows me last week was a 13 and a nine. So that tells me that perhaps on last Friday's close, which happens to have been in the range of where those two old highs were, I certainly could have taken some off. I could have taken all off. I'm, I'm not saying you would have, but you should do something when you get when you make money this quickly and you you know think about it. The market's not made to double your money in a week. It just isn't. There are rare events that occur um, very infrequently over the course of your lifetime as an investor that something like that's going to happen. Nothing wrong with taking partial profits. Um, when I have a huge move like this too, I'm also going to look at where's the stop out level from the 13. And that's up here at $118. That's this, these little dots here that's associated to this. So at a stop out level, I probably would take profits. And this is still, this 13 is still active because this was an intra-week move that all got all the way up to 160. You've got to properly, with a qualified and confirmed close, on a Friday close above 118 to stop out this 13. So I certainly could have sold some here. So let's say I sold half here last week and half here this week. Pretty good. My average price is, I don't know, maybe in here, 95 or something like that. Um, let the other people in the world deal with this, play with this, and have some sense of, you know, what to do. It's, it's um, you're not going to get the last penny out of this, and don't be greedy. You've already made a killing. You've done what you intended to do, which was take advantage of institutions that need to buy the stock, are forced to, with very few sellers up here to absorb the type buying pressure they're going to create. So whichever, and look, there are ways of coming up with scans to figure out what are low price stocks that meet certain criteria and are highly shorted in the institutional community. Um, and right now my guess is lots of these are starting to fly because the, this is gonna get around um, you know, the, the public that plays this game of, of actually being able to beat institutions. Usually doesn't happen that way. Usually the public's on the wrong side of this. Um, but so most importantly, if you play this game, have an exit strategy, figure out how would, you know, if you don't have access to this model, that's fine. Use other technical things, use measurements, use Fibonacci extensions, you know, figure out wave counts, where waves measure to, whatever it is, have a game plan um, because these things easily collapse just as fast as they go because there is no fundamental value uh, to have, you know, the stock trading where it is. So um, yeah, they've got, they've got the shorts right where they want them. You know, they're, they're in big pain. At some point, they may choose to short a heck of a lot more um, to average out their price because this is not likely to be able to sustain itself over time because the fundamentals don't say the company's worth anything close to this price. So that's this week's educational portion. And I hope that you, you gain some value from it. Let's go back and just take a quick look at week over week performance of the S and P sectors. Um, Notice that the break-even line here are different, just simply it's how the cut and paste works. So um, more important is, you know, look at green dots. We've got two sectors, three sectors that outperformed last week by more than 1% relative to the week before. Uh, but we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. I have that right? One, two, three, four, five, six sectors that underperformed by at least 1%. And by the way, this is not precisely week over week the way we normally do it because a week ago, Monday was the Martin Luther King. This is as of the Friday before. So this is actually about seven trading days worth of performance, not the standard five that we would look at. 
But like, look, for instance, what's happened to energy was up 12.3% versus the spiders. Now it's only up seven and change. So actually not a great, you know, it's a pretty big uh, decline in energy at performance for the week. And um, what, what else to move really big here? Financials, uh, um, wait, something's not right here. No, that's that. That should not be a. That should be a a red dot. Financials went from plus four point four to just minus like 0. 0.6. So bad week for financials. And I'm sorry, this should have been red, not green. Um, and the other real bad one looks like real estate. No, I'm reading. I'm sorry, I'm reading that one wrong. Uh, materials. Materials went from plus 3.6 to minus three and change. So if this stuff's right, which I count on it being, uh, there's some significant changes uh, week over week, or better said, I guess over the last seven days. So just as usual stuff to pay attention to. Let's go back to now, take a quick look at uh, what's going on in some of the markets. So here's IWM, the Russell 2000. Um, we've extended past equal legs. So if I took the low last year uh, to the highest high it made before the pullback and take that same amount of distance from the bottom of wave two, we're in wave three, we've already passed equal legs. So in potential, you know, in a bigger, longer lasting bull market, this, this would project up to 245 or so, which is one point that would make wave three, 1.618 times wave one. Uh, on pullbacks here, you can see how strong the market's been, almost always above the weekly conversion line. That's the, that's the uh, coming from the cloud chart. That's the fastest of all the numbers. So we continue to be above that. The one time uh, it looks like there was this in September, we had a weekly close beneath it, uh, lasted only a week, came right back and it's been above. So first, let's say initial support using the cloud chart, it's somewhere around 200-ish secondary support down here at 180. So, and I noticed that, you know, 180 is still above where it broke out from. So these are good support levels, I suspect. And again, up all the way up here at 245 um, would be some resistance. And let me look, uh, propulsion, we've already hit all the propulsion upside targets. So this still looks good, buyer and a pullback. Um, U.S. 10-year has stalled against the stopout level from this 13. We opened above, closed above it, but clearly a, a day that was negative. We've been trading off since. I think we're probably heading towards this gap uh, and the trend line over the next couple of weeks. Uh, I, I probably wait for a nine down, so five more days uh, from now of closing less than the close from four days back. Uh, so we could easily get a set of nine into the gap area or just beneath it. Uh, that's a place to potentially buy the yield chart, which would mean take advantage of the rally in bonds to sell the bonds. Um, given this type of setup, it's, you know, the question here, of course, is does the trend line break and the, the support that in theory should be here. Um, so anything north of, you know, right around 90 bips or so should be, bips meaning basis points, should be support. Um, it gets stickier if you come out underneath here, uh, then, you know, your next level down would be the lows down here, just in the low 80s. And then lastly, I thought, let me take a look at, I think we've looked at this in the past, but here's the platinum chart. This is platinum futures. And there is an ETF you can trade, it's PPLT, that pretty much tracks the platinum futures. So you can see, we in last year we broke out from uh, the downtrend line from all time highs. We moved up recently. You've got resistance right here against the top of the weekly cloud. And to me, that's why we're kind of stalling where we are. It also is darn close to where uh, old highs were. So you've got resistance anywhere from this week's highs uh, up to, let's say, just about 1,200. So we're at 1,100, that's 8% in here, uh, or not, I guess 9%. Um, if you can break out there, you're probably aiming towards close to 1,300 is the next target. I think it has a chance to get there this year. 
Um, so I kind of like platinum and um, I'd, I'd, I'd be looking in general to buy pullbacks. This is the only precious metal that has not significantly rallied. Uh, palladium did. Uh, it's, it's still the most expensive precious metal. It's trading at, uh, I don't know, $2,300 an ounce. Gold is, you know, I don't know, somewhere near $1,850 an ounce. Um, then you have platinum at $1,100 an ounce. But again, this hasn't broken out the way the other ones are. And then silver, of course, broke out upside last year. And, you know, we still have a partial position in In the No Trader from um, SLV in the 16 handle. And it's, it's in the 23 handle. So we're, we made 50% on that. And we still have, we actually recently added to the silver position. Um, so I actually think platinum, um, I'm, 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 not saying, I'm not saying I'm a buyer up here, but I would use pullbacks to buy platinum. I just, my sense is this is finally going to go uh, to the upside and has, you know, a good 20 or more percent to go before it runs into more significant problems. All right, so that's it for that. Now let's take a look at the names that were in Barron's roundtable as suggestions. So we're gonna start with, uh, let me see, do I have one up here yet or no? So let's just, we'll, we'll take our platinum chart and we will switch it to, all right, MSGS. This is uh, the sports part of, well, Madison Square Garden Sports. These are the owners of the Knicks and the Rangers. Um, one of the people on the round table, I think it might've been Mario Gabelli, um, who likes this name and uh, thinks at some point, the owners of the Knicks, the Dolan family will look to find, you know, look to be uh, sellers and then that somebody's gonna come in and buy them. Um, as of just looking at the chart, I don't see much at all here. Um, there is a gap there. If you're interested in maybe buying into the gap, you could, but you know, chart wise, there's still a huge unfilled gap on this side. Um, I just don't, I, I don't see much. So you, if, if you buy this, you're buying it purely as a speculative play that at some point, at some point in time, the Knicks will, somebody's gonna wanna buy the Knicks. Um, next, Aaron, Energy Partners, NEP, uh, obviously a bad week this week, uh, but in general, a, a strong chart that's broken out to the upside. Uh, let me add sequential. So you've also got a weekly 13 a couple of weeks ago, hasn't gotten stopped out yet. But I like this thing, you know, I buy on a pullback in the low 70s. EGR, Avangrid, sideways stuff. I do see it turns on nines off at weekly nine here high, weekly nine high, weekly nine low. We just did a weekly nine low. So I'd be more apt to be a buyer than a seller. Um, you know, we've come back down into where kind of the main part of support is. Nothing great. This is a sideways stock. So I don't really have much over time. Somebody suggested GLD for gold. Uh, gold should have some decent support anywhere from current price all the way down to the GLD down to 165. Um, that's kind of the real important support. And, you know, there's still a lot of people, including myself, that think over time gold is one of the places to be. Uh, unfortunately, we are out of time. So I will pick up where we left off uh, next week on some of these other uh, Barron's recommendations. And um, that's it. I am Rick Benson, and this has been In the No Trader.